Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Dramatic and lasting improvement of public school systems that serve large numbers of impoverished Black and Latino students has been the goal of educators, politicians, and community activists for decades. But has anyone actually achieved it? In her engrossing new book, Dale Russikoff, formerly a reporter for the Washington Post, tells a compelling narrative of how Cory Booker, the charismatic African-American mayor of Newark, New Jersey, joined forces with Mark Zuckerberg, the wealthy founder of Facebook, Chris Christie, the politically ambitious governor, and a host of other white philanthropists in an effort to transform the failing public schools of Newark. That they failed to do so, despite the expenditure of hundreds of millions of dollars and massive disruption to the lives of students and educators, says volumes about the complexity and hazards of trying to transform schools where so many children suffer from the effects of poverty. Her book, The Prize, Who's in Charge of America's Schools, has just been published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Welcome. Thank you. What got you interested in writing about the education, this particular education reform movement in Newark? Well, I had always been interested in education. I grew up in um, Birmingham, Alabama during the era of segregation and the civil rights movement. And so it's been something that sort of I was aware of and fascinated by and asking questions about from the beginning. Um, and then when I came to the Washington Post and into the New York Bureau, I was fascinated by Newark, which I covered as a beat, in, as part of my beat. And um, Newark really, I came to see it with the help of some very wise people who live there as sort of a metaphor for the urban crisis in America and how it came to be that way. And also the place where you can ask the question, now what? And when this gift was announced, this $100 million gift from Mark Zuckerberg to Cory Booker and Chris Christie, and they said they were going to use it to turn around an entire district. To transform it in not, five years. Yes, in five years. Um, of course, it sounded miraculous and maybe a bit beyond the possible, but I also thought, th I actually thought that something positive would come of it and that it would be a fascinating way to look at, you know, here's a city that actually is a metaphor for urban America. What does the education reform movement offer to a city like this? Um, what was the, I mean, could, could you briefly describe what the Newark public school system was like um, the system of Philip Roth and Leroy Jones back in the 50s compared to what it was like when this gift was given? Well, at the time, you know, in the 50s, they still had a, a school district that was seen as a fine school district. I mean, as you said, in the 50s, um, Philip Roth graduated from Weequake High School. Mary Baraka graduated from Barringer High School on the other side of town. There were still very stable schools, middle class communities were keeping them stable. Um, and then when the district, well, when the city basically collapsed economically after World War II and throughout the 50s and 60s, um, and there was a t period of white flight, um, the Newark riots, which in Newark are known as the rebellion because it was seen as an uprising against the oppressive conditions that people lived in, the af increasingly African-American community was living in. Um, then the schools kind of collapsed along with the city. And um, as whites fled, um, the white teachers were petitioning to transfer to the few schools where white kids were left. The, kid, the schools that were predominantly black had so few resources that um, there was an investigation by the NAACP that found that in the libraries of several schools there was nothing but comic books. Um, and the, the children were being ta taught almost exclusively by substitutes or predominantly by substitutes in the at predominantly African-American schools. And education basically broke down. At the same time, you know, there was, there was so much movement because of urban renewal, the destruction of neighborhoods. Families were concentrated in ha public housing in the center of the city. Children were constantly being moved around um, and the schools were very much in upheaval. So the schools have basically been gutted of teachers, of, of funds, um, uh, probably of energy and, and motivation. Yet the, the prize that you refer to in your title was the Newark Public Schools. Yes. So <clears throat> what was it that made it a prize and who was it a prize to? 
Well, the Newark Public School budget was a billion dollars a year at the time that Mark Zuckerberg gave his gift um, for 40,000 child school children who were going to the Newark schools. And it's a tremendous prize for political bosses who want, you know, who control, who, who want control of it so that they can make sure that the jobs are parceled out to the people who are loyal to them. There's a lot, there's 7,000 jobs in the school district. It's the biggest public employer in Newark, and it's the biggest employer period except for United Airlines, which is at Newark Airport. Um, and in addition, it's a, it's a source of incredibly fat contracts that, um, you know, the again, political organizations and politicians want to be able to control. So for generations, it's always been the source of conflict in the city between, you know, the various political bosses, the unions, um, the state government, which, as you, as you probably know, the state took over the Newark schools in 1995. Right. So the state has controlled the schools since, since that time, and they still control them. So um, this plan, this transformation in five-year plan is announced uh, on the Oprah show in September 2010. Could you just sort of briefly describe the, the prime movers in this plan, Booker, Zuckerberg, and Christie? Yes. Um, well, Cory Booker had been an advocate of expanding charter schools and bringing the ideas of the education reform movement to Newark since he'd been on the city council, you know, back in the 90s. And when Cory, when um, Chris Christie was elected governor in 2009 in an upset, uh, he was running against John Corzine, the Democrat, who was the incumbent. Um, Booker saw it as a great opportunity to, you know, sort of forge ahead on his whole agenda of education reform because Christie, unlike Corzine, agreed with him on the idea of expanding charter schools, the idea of holding teachers much more accountable for their students' performance, changing the teacher's contract, relaxing tenure, closing failing schools. All of these ideas were very much, you know, consistent with what Christie wanted and they were at, you know, exactly the opposite of what the previous governor had wanted. So Booker hadn't had a chance to press this, even, you know, even though he had a fellow Democrat in the governor's office. With Christie there, he did, and he went to him and said, let's, let's team up. You, you control the schools. I'm the biggest politician in Newark. I have the bully pulpit. Let's, tra let's transform the Newark schools the way we want to. Um, and let's do it in five years, and let's get a philanthropist to help us pay for all these changes. Enter Mark Zuckerberg. And Cory Booker met Mark Zuckerberg um, several months later, and Cory Booker is a very dynamic, persuasive person, and he basically sold Mark Zuckerberg on the idea that with your money, you can make a difference in this city where children are only reading, only 40% of children are reading at grade level. And Mark Zuckerberg said, you know, I believe this person can create change and I want to support him. One thing uh, I was struck about this book, I mean, because people um, often accused white society of having walked away from the public schools, at least the ones that have are predominantly black and, and, and Latina don't care about them. You know, we've taken our children out and we don't care about them. But there really have been through uh, history have been a lot of white philanthropists who have made it their goal to try to improve the education of blacks, Latinos in this country and, and, and the public schools in particular. That was one thing that I found very striking. Yes. Well, and it goes back to, you know, uh, just the years after Reconstruction right. when the white industrialists in the North spent a lot of money to create schools for black children in the South. Now, other actors were brought in as well. Um, Christopher Cerf be was, a, was, a, became, was hired as a state education commissioner. He came from New York, City. New York City, as did Cammie Anderson, yes. uh, the new superintendent of, uh, who's hired as a new su superintendent of Newark schools. So what were some of the early initiatives, big initiatives that Superintendent Anderson put into place? Well, before she came, because uh, there was a whole year after this gift was announced before the superintendent was even hired, they had started closing the, the lowest performing schools and replacing them with charter schools. So um, there, were, there were a couple of schools that um, were closed that year and charter schools were put in the buildings. And that 
um, you know, that, that created a lot of backlash in the city because there was no public process for deciding which schools were going to close or where children were going to go. Um, and, you know, in one case, the children had to walk across Westside Park to get to the next closest school. And that's a, a very unsafe uh, park. There's drug dealing and gang activity in that park. And these were children as young as kindergarten age. Um, so there was just a, you know, a, there was a backlash because there was a feeling that the interests of our children aren't fully being taken into account, only the interests of some children, the children for whom the charter schools are going to be an option. So um, that, that, was, that was one uh, problem that she walked into when the superintendent herself arrived. That had already happened. Um, her first um, really public, you know, big uh, initiative that affected a lot of families was to um, take 12 schools that were among the lowest performing schools and close and consolidate them so that there would be eight schools left. And um, the children would, would go to the consolidated school in some cases. And she, the, these were called... And enrollment was dropping, mm -hmm. so they really didn't need as many schools in the yes. city, right? Yes, I mean, this was part of the, the process was that um, at that point, a little over 20% of the kids had left the district to go to charter schools. And um, there, was, there were a lot of schools that were empty. Um, it, I'm sorry, they were partially empty. Right. And the idea was that we're spending a lot of money maintaining these schools and, you know, keeping the boilers operating and the heat operating and, and you know, we're wasting money that could be spent in the classroom. So her idea was let's close and consolidate these schools and use the money to make the resulting schools better, um, bring in new principals, let them pick most of their own teachers and give them extra resources because obviously they're de the lowest performing schools have the neediest children in them and they need more resources. So this was her idea um, to start reforming the district schools even as the charter schools were being offered as an option for a lot of kids as well. Right. So, and they were able to get some concessions in from the teachers' union in the teachers' co changes to the teachers' contract that they had wanted. Yes, um, the teachers agreed to. Um, well, the, the biggest thing they agreed to was that they would no longer get a raise. Teachers got an annual raise almost regardless of their evaluations in the past, but now only teachers who got a the top two ratings, highly effective and effective, would get their raise. Those who were judged partially effective and ineffective would not. And that's a, that's a huge difference because there was, you know, a certain percentage of teachers who expected and counted on getting a raise who didn't get it. And that was the, the union's agreement. And they also agreed that there would be merit pay. And that was paid for by the Zuckerberg money. Okay. Um, and that, uh, that would be like up to, well, um, on average, $5,000 um, for teachers who were at the very top of the scale, the highly effective teachers. And if they were in a, uh, a, one of the highest poverty schools, they would get $10,000. And if in addition to that, they were in a hard to place subject, they would get $12,500. And that was a, also a big change in the way teachers had been compensated. But they also wound up with uh, this pool of excess teachers, right? Yes. yes. And that was, that was something that the, um, the, the union would not agree to. I mean, that was as a result of something they wouldn't agree to because... Um, so, you were, Christie, so if you were a poor teacher, you wouldn't lose your job, but you would go into this pool where you weren't teaching anymore, but you were still getting paid. You were still getting paid. And um, what they had, you know, what, what Booker, Christie, and Zuckerberg had hoped was that um, they would be laying, that as, as the schools consolidated and, and hundreds and hundreds of teachers were no longer needed, that they would lay them off based on merit so that the, the weakest teachers would be laid off first. But um, the, the teachers union refused to concede seniority protections, which actually are a matter of state law, not of contract. And um, so this, the seniority protections um, were left in place, and it meant that as they laid off teachers, that the, the most junior teachers would have to go first regardless of merit, and the most senior teachers would stay regardless of merit. Um, and you had this big pool of teachers who weren't teaching, but you had to pay still. Yes, and over the th over three years, that ended up costing the district sixty million dollars for teachers who weren't in the classroom, all in the name of education reform. Right. <laughs> We're going to take a break. Then we'll be back with more with Dale Russikoff, author of The Prize: Who's in Charge of America's Schools? Right after this message. <laughs> Welcome back to One to One. 
I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Dale Russikoff, author of The Prize, Who's in Charge of America's Schools? It's just been published by Hewden Mifflin Harcourt. There was a lot of opposition to what um, Cammy Anderson, Superintendent Cam- Cammy Anderson, was trying to do. There was also, as there is, is whenever you have any kind of school reform, but there was also mismanagement of the money. Uh, educational consultants who were paid a thousand dollars a day, and huge contracts for consultants. Um, other ways money was wasted. Well, that is actually the main. There, there was uh, two million dollars. I'm sorry, twenty million dollars of the two hundred million went to consultants, and so that was one in ten. Uh, of the of the philanthropic dollars. Now, some of the consulting work was was very valuable and was very effective and useful and made you know a difference for the school district. But um, there were there was one firm that got six hundred thousand dollars for doing a report on you know recommendations for how best to spend the two hundred million, and the report wasn't ever even used mm-hmm. because they had gotten another consulting firm to do another report. Wow! So it just you know there there was just it was as if. You know, when you have a lot of philanthropic money, the first thing you do is hire consultants and save. Right. And, and, and you, you consider a cash cow, you know, people going after that money. Were there some real achievements of the Booker, Anderson, Christie reform plan? Well, I think that they would say that the expansion of the charter schools was an achievement. Um, because, as I said, 40% of kids are now in charter schools, whereas at the beginning, 20% of kids were in charter schools. Um, and while charter schools nationally do not outperform district schools at all, um, in Newark, the charter schools have had a much better record, I mean, dramatically better on the state standardized tests. So, um, you know, they would argue that that's a great improvement for mm-hmm. kids. Um, the one oh, thing. I'm sorry. You go ahead. And I think they would argue that the um, that the teachers' contract is an improvement, even though, you know, at this point, the the district school children um, are their their state test scores on the NJ ASK, which is the, the state standardized test, have gone down right. grades three through eight. Um, but I think they would argue that the teachers' contract is going to improve the quality of the teaching force over the years. Do they still have that big pool of excess teachers? Well, that's another thing. Because the district was in such a financial crisis as a result of this, um, they've now been placing those teachers back in the classroom. So after saying that they were not competent to be in the classroom... And now they're back in the classroom. They're back in the classroom. Uh, what, an interesting th- thing you include is that um, a big difference between charter schools and district schools is that in charters, it's easier to get the money into the classroom. Yes. Whereas it seems like in the district, the money just gets frittered away. Well, it happens, a lot, it happens a lot more in the district because the district has a tremendous amount of legacy costs from all of the years of this being really a patronage pit. Um, so there are jobs that really are not you know, um, relevant to the education of children that are still in the school district. And there are contracts that are, you know, going to the favored um, right. that, that may not really be, um, you know, um, the right amount of money that, that's needed for that work, if it's needed at all. So um, that, and then the other, the other issue is that the district has um, an older workforce, which is more expensive than the charters, and that makes health care more expensive. So there are reasons that it costs more um, for the district to run itself than mm-hmm. it costs the charters. But in addition, there were constantly discoveries of things that were just being spent, you know, dollars being spent on completely wasteful enterprises. Like, for example, the um, the head of facilities discovered that the um, uh, the the high intensity lights at football fields were being left on all night, and that it was costing over three hundred thousand dollars a year for the wow. school district to keep that going. And um, the district gave me figures on what it costs to, you know, per student in the district to clean the schools, the custodial costs, and said they said custodial services come to twelve hundred dollars per student per year, whereas the charter schools that I talked to, they said their custodial costs were four hundred dollars per student per year. So I don't know what the difference is, you know, if it's wages, if it's the number of people in the district, but there's just clearly a cost structure in the district that's just way out of whack with um, with what costs really are. Right. 
At the same time that Booker and Christie and Zuckerberg were trying to carry out transformational change in uh, system-wide, there were some committed teachers in the Newark schools who were trying to put into effect their own reforms. Uh, and there was a group at the Avon Avenue School. Um, and one specific challenge was a student named Alif Beya. Um, talk a little bit about what they were doing with him. Well, um, the, the assistant principal for the middle school um, and one of his teachers discovered that he, when he was in seventh grade, he was barely able to read. Um, and so they got one of the, um, well, there was a, a special ed teacher who was uh, just learning a new um, technique to, to help children who hadn't learned to, to read in the regular classroom um, learn to read all over again. And so she agreed to work with this boy, Alif, um, one period a day um, for an entire school year to try to help him sort of relearn what he what he never learned correctly and um, so he started working with her and very very gradually um, he bought into it and um, he was um, a very popular kid and they were you know very surprised but he began to see that he was actually for the first time ever succeeding in school um, because and reading he, was the real it, issue it was, because he was learning to read right. and um, he was he was gaining he was able to see that he was getting to be a better reader and the other thing that was kind of amazing about this boy was that he was a phenomenal basketball player and it was as as he got better and better basketball season was starting and he was the captain of the basketball team and his basketball even got better and um, there was this whole kind of change in this boy and it was amazing because the um, the the special ed teacher who worked with him um, when they first started working together she said look I and he he had had a, a history of terrible behavior problems and she said look I don't want you to think I'm judging you but I need to know why do you get in trouble so much and he said if I act out and get thrown out of class nobody finds out I can't read right so there was this whole issue of just complete lack of self-esteem in this kid and over the course of the year um, not only did his basketball team win the the citywide championship for middle school, and he became the most valuable player in Newark, which is quite something for middle school. Um, he also made in uh, in that year he went from be testing as a second grade reader at the beginning of the year to reading at the f at a fifth grade level by the end of the year. And in some skills, like the skill of sounding out words, he was at an eighth grade level. His story and what they did with him seems to be an example of the tremendous amount of human resources that are required to bring students who have a lot of issues to bring them up to standard. Yes. A tremendous amount of human resources. And when you have, you know, if you got 45,000 students or 30,000 students with, you know, these huge disadvantages, it just shows you the human resources that are needed, yes. you know, to be channeled, yes. to channel at them. So um, at some point it became clear that the reform plan was starting to bog down. What totaled it finally? Well, you know, it, it actually went through in large part, you know, most, most of what they did put in place did go through, but okay. it, it bogged down um, in, in a public sense because there was such widespread opposition to it that there was really almost like a citywide uprising. Um, and this was because um, there was no public participation in all of the decisions that it was were top made. down. It was top down and it was, you know, they, they were changing almost everything about the way education was experienced. They were closing many more schools than Cami Anderson had closed at the outset. Um, in fact, it was a, a third of the district schools were either being closed, consolidated, repurposed, restructured. You know, they were just um, were turned into a charter school, turned into a contract school. Um, and the, um, the, the city was, you know, children, th literally thousands of children were, were having to change schools. Um, and there was no vetting of this plan with parents. There was also a change that, that Newark had always had um, neighborhood schools and kids walked to school. And because, you know, so many of the neighborhood schools um, had a, a very high failure rate, the 
part of the reform plan was to give people an option to choose another school, a right. school across town or a charter school, and have one universal enrollment system where you could pick any school charter or district anywhere in the city, which, you know, would be great for those who got into the better schools, but it would leave people who didn't in the same situation. And also, it completely changed the experience of education. Instead of, for all time, walking to your neighborhood school, now kids were having to, and parents were having to navigate a brand new system. And again, it wasn't necessarily that with, with input and participation, maybe people would have thought this was a good change. Maybe they would have found ways to adjust it that would have made it more you know, salutary, but the fact that it was just imposed on them from the top down, um, such a massive upheaval in the way kids went to school, it, it became a cause for great suspicion and opposition. And as you may know, it led to the, well, it, it fueled the, the election of the next mayor, Raz Baraka, who was really in style and in substance um, running as the anti-booker. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, Booker goes away and runs, is elected He's to the, the Senate, Senate, goes away, and uh, Cammy Anderson quits, and uh, Surf leaves for a while, the, the, uh, state, the, commissioner. the state commissioner. And it, it's, it's really an amazing story. And um, if, we, if we had more than 10 seconds left, I would ask you what are the, the lessons of the <laughs> Uh, we'll have uh, to do part two. <laughs> what, what, what are the lessons of this, but we'll have to do part two. But it really... It was a very fascinating book that tells you how, how difficult it is to transform um, these kinds of public school systems and all of the, it's, it's hard. And I think it shows, too, um, what you were saying about a leaf, that you really need a tremendous concentration of human resources at the level of the schools and the building because you are dealing with the consequences of poverty. You're not just dealing with education, and that's an expensive proposition. Okay. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Dale Rusikoff for joining me today. The Prize, Who's in Charge of America's Schools, has just been published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.